Bienvenidos y bienvenidas a todos y todas. Welcome uh, everybody. Es un gran honor y placer. It's a great aquí. honor and pleasure to be here today. Uh, el profesor Luca Passanante. I'm here to present Dr. Dr. Professor Luca Passanante, Chair of Procedure de, uh, Law in Brescia University. He has published several research and studies in different topics, starting, of course, on evidence topics, but also on procedural um, law, um, common law, compared law. Um, eh, y también eh, autor de un volumen sobre eh, los precedentes. He has also y eh, bien, eh, les voy a dar primero about unas topics. Eh, comunicaciones eh, de organización, eh, porque, porque como saben, eh, para poder participar eh, en el debate que se abrirá Before we start, en las I'm going to give you some indications. Paneles que se, les celebra se celebrarán hoy y mañana. Es necesario que las personas If you want to participate in the panels and in the debates that are going to take place between today and tomorrow, you need to use the app. There is an official app, so you have to write your question. If you are one of the speakers of any of the activities within the week, you can ask for the floor and you can directly speak here in the room. In order to do that, you need to first download the app and in the main menu, you get into the icon called Ask the floor and then you access to a specific panel of conference. Once you are right there, on the uh, right corner, escribir, on the lower palabra, part, you will see a plus media. sign. So you have to click on that en one, cambio, and then si you can ask for the floor. You have no also to click on send. However, if you are not speaker, speaker, if you are a participant, you can uh, ask things in writing. Again, you have to use the principal. official app. You have to go to the main menu. And you need to get to the part where it says questions to speakers. Once you are there, you also select the conference or the where you want to ask the question. On the lower part of the right, you will see this plus sign. You click on it, you write your question, and then send. Entonces, sin más, uh, la palabra a uh, el profesor Luca Passanante. So, que nos hablará without more de delay, I will directly give the word to Luca Passanante, who is going to talk about Michele Tarufo and his study on research. Please, Mr. Passanante. Buenos días. Todas y a todos. Good morning, everyone. Antes que nada, quiero agradecer los organizadores y en particular First al profesor all, Jordi like Ferrer. First of all, I'd like to thank all the organizers and especially Professor Jordi Ferrer for inviting me here today Tarufo. to this extraordinary congress es un gran honor para dedicated to Michele Tarufo. Y soy It's an honor to be here today. De esta tarea. And I am aware that it's a huge responsibility. Una advertencia. Dado que este ponencia ha sido corregido I en la forma, por lo menos, por el propio Jordi Ferrer. Sent this speech to Jordi Ferrer and he has eh, helped me with it. And Chile, also the Evelyn Vieira student Evelyn Vieira from the Pontificia of Chile University because she has been in Brescia in the last months and she's here with us today. I'd like to say that they have both helped me and I thank them for them. So first of all, I'd like to warn you about my Spanish because it seems I speak better than I do. Bueno, es difícil decidir por dónde empezar. It's hard to decide what to start. más allá de cumplir con el compromiso aceptado de tratar because el tema elegido, beyond fulfilling the commitment accepted to deal with the chosen topic, I would like to talk first about Michele Tarufo. His friend and colleague Jordi Ferrer has gratefully dedicated this extraordinary world event. Vale la pena this is an event no es which is único, worth remembering. Pero está destinado a repetirse. And it's not the only one. It is going to be repeated every three years. It's its destiny. Michele Tarufo needs no introduction. But I would like to say some words about his life. This might be useful. 
Nacido en Villevano, he was born in Bijevano on 12 of February in 1943. He was a disciple of Vittorio Dendi and a student of Collegio Gisliere. He graduated in law in 1965 at the same University of Pavia, where he was also a professor from 1976 to 2013. Afterwards, he was a meritus of civil procedural law. De la he was a member de Incei, of the Academia Nazionale Fue de Incei since 2005, and he was a visiting professor at numerous foreign universities. Solo por I can a just Cornelos mention School, a few here, Cornell Law School, Hastings of Law, College of the Law, at the University San of San Francisco, San Francisco California, de China the China University Center of Political Beijing, Science and Law in Beijing, Pontificia Universidad Católica in Peru, Pontificia Universidad Católica of Chile, Chile and Juridica de la the Girona. Cattedra Cultura Juridica here at the University of Girona. Italia y en numerosos países he del has held conferences and seminars in Italy and in many countries around the world. With Geoffrey Hassard, he Law was co-reporter on an American Law Institute project. And UNIDRA. He was therefore drafting transnational procedural rules and principles. He has cooperated on a regular basis to the Procedural Law Research Center of China, University of Political Science and Law in Beijing. And he was awarded eight honorary degrees in different universities around the world. Fue Tarufo un jurista ilustre was an illustrious and extraordinary jurist. And I'm here also talking in the etymological sense of extraordinary. He was a distinguished proceduralist. And from the beginning, he was able to explore or deal with the classic in original perspective almost always with an interdisciplinary and comparative look. Despite his fidelity to such a classical subject and characterized by a highly dogmatic approach, especially at the time he began his studies, talking here about civil procedural law, his interests in scientific production have oscillated in various fields of knowledge, from philosophy to semiotics, from epistemology to history, de las de from la theories of probability to logic. El enfoque multidisciplinar the multidisciplinary la and lato sensu comparative approach has marked all his teaching. Desde el primero de sus artículos, se From the first of his articles, hacia otras there is attention towards other disciplines. Y hasta el último, and you can see that to the last of his books. And finally, in a very short but very incisive paper, which was published once he was dead, it doesn't have a title, it's been entitled Babel's Tower, both an international review of procedural law and in question facti. Tarufo recommends not to remain confined within the confines of one's own language and subject matter. Como escribió muy bien Angelo Dondi, but el alumno as Angelo mayor, Dondi, who was his eldest pupil Tarufo, in Italy, el verdadero rasgo so well wrote, distintivo de Tarufo, Tarufo's true distinguishing feature y solidez was his, his, his intellectual statue, curiosidad a statue cultural, and solidity, and solidity. Un impulso constante dominated by an inexhaustible cultural curiosity, a constant urge to undertake new studies and readings that take him beyond borders. Diversos encuentros con maestros y colegas Various encounters with masters and colleagues have marked the stages de Tarufo of Tarufo's life, como hombre y como both as a man and as a researcher. Entre tantos, parece justo recordar al menos so many, siete, no solo por ser significativos, sino también por ser emblemáticos, pero también porque fueron emblemáticos y particularmente fortunados. La elección arbitraria 
no pretende the arbitrary choice does not intend to no subtract other numerous and no less important encounters. Of el primero, the first one, it was a decisive one, con Vittorio Denti. and it was a meeting with Vittorio Denti. Maestro, gracias al cual Tarufo in, inicia he sus estudios was de derecho procesal professor, civil, and thanks to him, Tarufo began his studies of civil procedural law with a philosophical and cultural approach, very innovative for the time. Y luego um, declinó he, en muchos sentidos el interés por la comparación. Características to this, que siempre y cada vez más marcaron la investigación y la producción and científica. All, all these characteristics de have always marked Un segundo encuentro de gran importancia fue el de su amigo was the y one with his friend and colleague Federico Carpi. Carpi. Junto a quien ganó el concurso he won together para la with him the competition for the professorship in 1975 for the chair. And this meeting with Carpin meant a very close and fruitful link con la revista with the Revista Trimestral de Diritto y Procedura Civil, which was previously directed by Tito his Carnacini. master, his professor Tito Carnacini. In, páginas, in those pages, Tarufo décadas, published for decades with tireless commitment. El mismo encuentro con Federico Carpi this sería meeting with Federico Carpi was later, later, a few years later, la base be para la the basis for the foundation together with Vittorio Colesanti of the highly successful brief commentary of the Code of Civil Procedure, the Italian one. Este no solo fue un encuentro significativo por razones científicas was not only significant y académicas, of sino que reasons, dio lugar a una de las más estrechas relaciones de amistad y estima recíproca en toda la vida de Tarufo. Un tercer encuentro fundamental fue con Gian Antonio Micheli, quien ya alumno del Colegio Vizieri, había enseñado en la Universidad de Padilla. A Micheli, Le se había encomendado el papel de relator general sobre el tema de la prueba en el proceso en ocasión del Congreso Internacional de Derecho Civil Procedural Civil, celebrado en Ghent desde el 24 de agosto hasta el 4 de Organizado it was Marcel organized Storm. by Marcel Storm. Micheli solicitó a Tarufo que lo asista en el papel de relator general. Asked Tarufo to assist him in the role of general rapporteur, and he entrusted him as well la tarea de examinar with the task of examining the national reports, drafting the general report, and participating in the final discussion of the Congress. El texto del informe the text general of the general report was then published by Gloria Springer the following year. Bajo el título, it was entitled with a human Towards face. Justice with a Human Face. También el encuentro con Giovanni Tarello the meeting with Giovanni Tarello indelebilmente el curso marked de sus estudios. Clearly the cause Tarello no solo Tarello estuvo entre los padres de la escuela del realismo jurídico en general, sino que también fue entre muchas cosas el fundador en 1971 de la revista Trimestral de Derecho Procedural Civil. The founder in 1971 of the journal Materiali per una storia della cultura giuridica per una storia la delle culture giuridiche, which was published by Il Molino. L'attenzione to historical data in line with just realist orientations and his attention to the doctrine of civil procedure led Tarello to write one of the most significant works of the 20th century on the subject, the history of modern legal culture. Pues bien, fue el propio well, Tarello que it was Tarello himself Le señaló a Tarufo una grave lacuna en la historia del derecho procesado, procedural law. invitándolo a llenarla con un estudio histórico, algo que se producirá puntualmente unos años después con la publicación por Il Mulino en 1980 del volumen La Justicia Civile in Italia, civile in Italia del 700 a oggi. De que tenemos también una traducción al portugués de we also have Daniel a translation Mitiguero. into Portuguese done by Daniel Mitiguero. Un quinto encuentro a fifth crucial meeting, which was also key for Tarufo's scientific experience and for the evolution of his research, 
fue con Jeffrey was Hazard. together with Jeffrey Hazard. Una autoridad en el campo del derecho procesal civil He is an authority in the field of American civil procedure law. And Tarufo defined him as a curious American precisamente por su precisely because of his propensity a to compare and to reject a certain dañino harmful American Acercándose al derecho procesal civil de los países anglosajones a través de los estudios que dieron vida a la sobre el adversario system a los finales de los años 70, a Tarufo también gracias a la relación con Hazard al exterior. No solo con él publicó el libro Cuatro Manos, with him, he published a 400 book edited in Italian and English on civil justice in the United States. Sino que but he also una initiated a collaboration that would give life to one of the largest experimental and avant-garde projects ever published in, in the course of a century. Este es el proyecto this is a project sponsored and financed first American by Law Ali Institute, American Law Institute and afterwards by UNIDVA for the, for the drafting of transnational rules and principles of civil procedural civil. law. In, la que in which several prestigious colleagues from all over the world participated, and whose final version was published by Cambridge University Press in 2006. In los Estados Unidos, Tarufo in the United States, Tarufo had also años been called for several years to teach comparative civil procedure law en la at de Cornell Law de School. Después, Afterwards, he was offered a professorship, a chair, but he preferred to return to Italy. Otro encuentro afortunado, Another fortunate meeting was facilitated Comanducci, by Paolo Comanducci. This one took place in 1998, en el Congreso Italo at the Italian-Spanish Congress of Analytical Theory, Theory of Law. Donde Tarufo, Tarufo con, here met a un joven Jordi Ferrer. Jordi Ferrer, when he was very young, de su he had just finished his doctorship. Tarufo, en este momento, his doctorate. And Tarufo, at that time, Ibanez, thanks to Perfecto Andrés Ibáñez, already had a publisher for the publication in Spanish of his book, La Prova, Prova dei Fatti Giuridici. Pero aún no But tenía el at the time, he did not have the translator yet. Ese mismo día, However, en el Congreso, that same day, los tres, at the Congress, Tarufo, the three of them, Tarufo, Perfecto Andrés Ibáñez, and Jordi Ferrer, they met y and they decided that the translator Jordi would Ferrer. be Jordi Ferrer. Ferrer, Ferrer writes, al respecto. Cito textualmente. I'm quoting here, Fue un largo it was a long and exhausting yelp, que duró casi tres años, which lasted almost three years, ese tiempo, but during that time we had hundreds of female exchanges y and personal conversations, y and I learned so much que tengo la that I often have the feeling ignorant. of being very ignorant. Que de tan impresionado con su trabajo, que I was so impressed with his work that I continue to study those same topics up to this day. In our dialogues, which became more and more frequent on our various trips together during his stays in Girona, Tarufo displayed a strange combination of assertiveness and intellectual humility. His views were ser often forceful, firm, firm incluso and expresados con vehemencia. Así era su carácter. Pero al mismo tiempo, time, era capaz de tomar en serio el argumento contrario y no tenía reparo en citarse a sí mismo como ejemplo de alguien que había apoyado una idea que ahora no le parecía mal. mal. Se llama Seriedad this is called intellectual seriousness. El afortunado encuentro Even the fortunate Ferrer encounter with Ferrer tuvo un had doble a double meaning. Por un lado, On the one hand, libro, the book, The Proof of the Facts, an impeccable Italian, translation of the Italian original, this time opened the doors of Latin America to Tarufo, where, despite being already well known for his studies, he achieved una widespread popularity. Por otro lado, On the other hand, 
lo che se convertirà what in una relazione di mutua stima e profonda amistà si risolviò e la esperienza di Taruffo come professore invitato e la Università di Girona, Girona dove per la missione tra su jubilazione after his retirement from the Italian Italia University in 2013 in 2013, lavorando e studiando durante quattro anni nella Cattedra di Cultura Chair of Legal Culture, dirigita, directed dirigita by por Jordi Ferrer Jordi Ferrer. Un settimo incontro di grande importanza fu con Ronald Allen, uno dei principali e più distinguiti esperti nel mondo del diritto all'autorio, il professor John Henry And Professor John Henry Wickmore, Professor at Northwestern University of Chicago. At this time, Allen offered Tarufo an essential moment of confrontation. Sometimes they didn't have the same ideas, and he opened Tarufo donde en los años 80 ya Tarufo había estado en una larga misión y donde luego en los últimos años fue regularmente invitado a dar conferencias en materiales del Instituto de Evidence Law y Forensic Science de la China University of Political Science and Law. Omití ciertamente detenerme en encuentros no menos significativos, very important meetings as well, for instance, with the proceduralist and friend Sergio Carloni, que falleció algunos algunas semanas hace unas semanas, a few weeks ago, con el amistoso contradictor Bruno Cavallone, with the friendly contradictor Bruno Cavallone, with the legal philosopher George Ibrovleski, with the proceduralist comparatist Eduardo Teiza, with the economist Giorgio Lunghini, with the sociologist Maria Rosaria Ferrarese, and many others. Sobre los que no puedo detener, but I cannot just stop on all of them because I don't have that long to be able to talk here. No podemos hablar de Michele Taruffo We cannot talk about Michele Taruffo without talking about the journey. El viaje es para Taruffo, the journey for Taruffo, as the president of the International Association of Procedural Law, reminded it's a symbol of his passion for overcoming barriers and prejudice. It's a real life motive that deeply dominates his scientific experience, and so much that it becomes the symbol of a method which almost le leads him to adopt an eccentric point of view with respect to the object of his study. Being here and elsewhere offers indisputable advantages and makes his work as a unique comparator. His work is rich and authentic. The vastness of his culture keeps him solidly sheltered from provincialisms. These are sometimes found in the incursions into foreign law of those who are less experts. The concept of journey translated into action until the end. Medellin, Colombia, Medellin, Colombia October, October 2019. We can see him here invited by her disciple and friend Diana Maria Ramirez. This journey satisfies two different needs of the same direction. On one hand, emancipation from the context of origin and the need to satisfy an incredible curiosity. Thus, this journey or travel, which has nothing to do with tourism, becomes a life experience, a means to immerse oneself in a distant reality to understand it, to absorb it, to treasure it. In short, a precious currency that rewards the effort of those who, going to distant places to teach, they return enriched. As Federico Carpi writes, Michele Tarruffo travels a lot. 
está Travel en el centro is de at the center of his life. En un sentido casi In an almost metaphysical sense. A pesar del cansancio de Despite the vuelos, fatigue of long flights, como encuentro de culturas y de he hombres, finds travels as an encounter of cultures and men who are attracted by an inexhaustible intellectual curiosity. Pasemos ahora a hablar And we now turn to the subject itself of my lecture. In this case, it is not easy to decide where to begin. I could decide to begin speaking about probably Michele's most important work, which is undoubtedly the most salient, La Prova dei Fatti Giuridici, which I believe is the pinnacle of his uh, thought on evidentiary matters. Or I could start by using a predominantly chronological criterion that starts from the first testimonies we now have of Terufo's thought on evidential matters. And I believe that the latter may be uh, the best decision because it's inspired also by that lifeline that you will have a chance to see exhibited at the library room at the University of Girona, where you will be able to uh, get acquainted with Michele Terufo's fund. And there is good reason to believe that the first testimony of Terufo's thinking on evidential matters is the first paper that he published in the Revista di in 1967, a work that uh, uses the title of a famous uh, article by Calamandrei of several years before that, 1939, and then he criticizes it, at least in some aspects. However, that is not the case. In actual fact, the first uh, sample of the thought of uh, the teacher and uh, wise man whose memory we're honoring today is contained in his graduate thesis, in his dissertation, uh, which he focuses on the maxim of experience. And he defended it in Pavia under the supervision of Vittorio Denti on December 15th, 1965. And there's a story to tell about this, which not everybody knows. Jordi Ferre did uh, mention something about this in his opening remarks. Michele's wife, Cristina de Maglia, in agreement with her daughter Ana Tarufo, according to her, and I must say also in agreement with me, and I'm extremely grateful to her for that, decided to donate Michele Stadufo's library to the Chair of Legal Culture at the University of Girona. A couple of months ago, I was here in Girona uh, in order to study, and then I asked uh, Jordi Ferre if by any chance among the thousands of volumes that uh, were sent was also Tarufo's dissertation, uh, his graduate thesis because no one knew where it was. And Jody called the person in charge of the catalog of the collection who brought us this extraordinary document. I must say that in Italy, the academic year that ends with uh, the graduate degree demands that the student prepare a paper and uh, a dissertation to be discussed, what we call the thesis. This was the case in 1965, and it's still the case today. And the first thing that strikes our attention about this work is the depth with which a 22-year-old boy dared to tackle a subject as difficult as that of the maxims of experience. It is not even possible to compare the rigor, the breadth, uh, of this very, very young Michelino Tarufo. He was not yet Michele Tarufo, the adult. So I was saying it is not even possible to compare what he wrote to the works that we are forced to read in 2022 in undergraduate theses and even as PhD dissertations sometimes. It suffices us to read the first few pages to immediately get the impression that we are reading a work that being cautious 
could be defined as extremely promising. However, it is just truly remarkable. And it is extremely important, now that we speak about this, for you to understand that this extraordinary piece of work, which uh, remained unknown until recently, has been scanned and will be readable as of today, as part of the catalog of the library at the University of Tirona. So at the end of my uh, presentation, Everyone who has signed up at the conference will receive a link to Tarufo's dissertation through the conference app. And I must say that it is a pleasure for me to be able to uh, tell you something which is uh, news and is amazing, and I heard this from Jordi some days ago. The dissertation will be translated by uh, Perfecto Andrés Ibáñez, nonetheless, and published by Marcial Pont. Now, before we start sketching a rough analysis of its contents, I think it's worthwhile underscoring the significance of the subject matter that the young Tarufo chose. A subject that provides him with a point of view, a uh, perspective that will mark his entire scientific production. Following the famous uh, definition by Stein, uh, the maxims of experience, Erfahrungsgesetze, or, or also Lebensregeln, which literally means uh, rules of life, are hypothetical definitions or judgments of general content that are independent of the specific case to be decided uh, during the process and its individual circumstances that has been acquired through experience. However, they remain autonomous regarding the individual cases from whose observation they were drawn and beyond which they claim value for other cases. Now, this is a definition that is still in force today. Uh, used by the Italian uh, Cassation Court, which has repeated it for decades in, Carlin, in Cardinal Lutti's translation of it in his book La Prova Civile, the first edition of which came out in 1915. Now, according to this definition, these maxims of our experience are obviously norms that claim to be uh, applied uh, universally. However, they are not legal norms, they are rules of activity drawn from common sense, which are not formalized in law, to which the judge must adhere in formulating the judgment of fact on the basis of available evidence. Now, the subject matter that was chosen projects the Rufo out of the scope of procedural law and the law itself. Therefore, he was forced to confront himself with philosophy and logic, semiotics, epistemology. Therefore, that marked the development of his studies. But by the same token, what years later, and especially in the Anglo-Saxon cultural environment, would become the future of studies on evidence. And I'm thinking about the work by William Twining or Susan Hack. Now, this uh, contrasts it with the cultural environment of the time, which was dominated by the idea that the object of evidence was essentially the exclusive prerogative of uh, uh, legal experts and jurists, uh, specifically proceduralists, who in turn believed that uh, they had to deal with it, limiting themselves to the study of the legal rules rules of evidence. Today, things have changed significantly. However, at the time, we must understand that the only method that was considered scientific in the legal field, and especially in civil procedural law, was the dogmatic method. 
Anything uh, that was uh, distant from dogmatic was uh, um, shunned and even uh, sneered at. Tarufo, with his uh, graduate dissertation, even though applying uh, strictly uh, methodological rigor, began to move away from what in today's perspective could be considered a cultural cliché. But at the time, it was uh, considered nearly the only way of uh, doing research. Now, why did Tarufo uh, adopt this approach? First of all, we need to know that Tarufo, during his high school years, uh, had a philosophy teacher, thanks to whom he had become very passionate about this matter. Also, it, after he joined the Ghislieri uh, College in Pavia in 1961, uh, where he uh, was granted a scholarship, uh, he attended the first Italian course on deontic logic during the academic year of 1963-1964, which took place in the same Collegio Ghislieri and taught by Amedeo Giovanni Conte. Just one second, says the speaker. Tarufo used to tell me that at the beginning he had asked Conte himself to be his supervisor for his graduate uh, dissertation. Conte, having sensed the young Tarufo's talent, selfless talent, explained that his university career, Conte's career, was only the beginning. So he would not have allowed, uh, he, he couldn't uh, offer a valuable advice to a student with a brilliant academic feature, future. He then directed to uh, someone who was probably uh, the best suited for these interdisciplinary approaches, which was Vittorio Denti. And that's how Tarufo wrote a graduate thesis on the maxims of experience, combining the studies of philosophy and logic with those of civil procedural law. Now, the importance of the discovery of this text is such that I would like at this point to take some time to quickly review its contents. In the first chapter, uh, Tarufo acknowledges uh, Friedrich Stein the merit of having isolated in the context of the intellectual activity of the judge and of the means that he or she can use to reach the determination of the fact to which the dispute refers, the concept of maximum, uh, uh, maximum of experience and of having determined its structure and function within a de facto based judgment. However, Tarufo argues, Italian doctrine had a accepted Stein's thought in a rather uh, non-critical manner. Tarufo argues that the concept of a maximum of experience as set forth by Stein is outdated and no longer adheres to the results achieved by the evolution of logical thought. And this is the point in which a reasoned critique begins of a uh, maxim of experience. And the central point uh, upon which this criticism is based is given by the fact that this maxim of experience, given that uh, it's a fruit of indu inductive reasoning, cannot be really considered a general rule. Therefore, it cannot be seen uncritically as a major premise of the syllogism to be able to achieve the judgment of the fact itself. So, excluding that a deductive syllogism may be used to uh, carry out this judgment of the facts means opening the possibility for the inductive uh, reasoning of the judge to be reduced to a strictly subjectivist uh, dimension. Therefore, it cannot be relied or controlled. 
Tarufo believes that the inductive syllogism cannot be a valid replacement or substitute for deductive syllogism. However, at the same time, he's convinced that the inductive uh, logic may constitute an effective instrument to get to know reality. And to further this research, Tarufo was uh, found inspiration in the studies of Rudolf Carnap, a German philosopher and logician, a naturalized American, who was also an exponent of the Vienna Circle and of logical positivism or neo-positivism. Now, what are the most important repercussions of this uh, encounter, let's say, of a Tarufa that was still a student with Carnap's thought? Now, to my mind, the following have been extremely significant. First, Ruling out deductive logical syllogism should not uh, force us to study the fact as a purely subjective and therefore uncontrollable judgment. Secondly, the logical uh, reasoning or judgment is expressed in the relations that exist between the propositions. Thirdly, uh, this uh, um, in the inductive logical judgment consists in nothing other than determining whether and to what degree a given hypothesis is confirmed by the set of observations commonly called E, as in evidence. Fourth, uh, the relevant concept of probability in the context of making the judgment of fact through inductive logic is um, that of uh, um, probability. Fifth, it's between propositions and not between uh, the subject, the cognizing subject, and the thing that should be studied, because in the latter case, the validity of logical probability is reduced to a mere subjective fact. If we follow Tarufa's thinking, the field of knowledge is uh, marked by the concept of reliability, degree of confirmation, and probability. Now, these are notions that are prevalent in inductive logic, which in turn is not governed by relations of certainty and necessity, but by relations of indeterminacy and probability. Now, if we follow uh, Carnap, or Tarufa rather followed Carnap, and came to the conclusion that in the end uh, he will never rule it out, but rather uh, he will use in, in, inference because it's free of subjectivist implications. It is a pure logical relation based on the semantic interpretation of propositions. It is neither verifiable nor falsifiable by empirical experience because it does not tackle it and it is based on a logical procedure. And once again, at a certain point, the judge's activity ceases to have as its job, as its object, the facts, and it becomes a logical and semantic activity. And it is precisely the fruit of this enunciation, this utterance in prepositions, that then the judge makes of the evidential facts the element on which the possibility of a control of the judgment will be based. Now, about this, Tarufo used the term conviction. However, he, he distances himself from the concept of moral certainty that was so widespread at the time and stated that the judge's conviction has nothing to do with the emotional force with which he adheres to a certain version of the fact but rather with the logical properties of the elements that form the basis of his conviction. There are many works by Michele Tarufo where he has repeated, where he repeated this notion. But not only that, in his graduate dissertation, Tarufo already puts forth the problem of a fact-based judgment as the problem of a confirmation of a hypothesis, which it may seem obvious for us today, but at the time it was at least an unusual statement against the backdrop of civil procedural uh, literature. So, Tarufo called into question the classical logical model that was believed to be usable at the time 
to apply the maxims of experience, that is the nomological deductive model that was developed by Rudolf Carnap. And I believe that the dialogue that many years after that was created with Giovanni Tusset's uh, works is very important, such as La Priva Razonada, or uh, the possibility to choose. Now, this is one of the most outstanding elements of the whole thesis. But it doesn't stop there. Once again, it deals with the issue of the judgment, of relevance of the evidence, also here as a logical judgment of a hypothetical nature based on the prediction of effectiveness that a, that a piece of evidence may have if it, if it is experienced in practice. And this is a notion that will be further developed in his first first book of 1970, Studies sulla la relevanza della prova. Now, the dissertation also devotes many pages to the relation between maxims of experience and presumptions. Also, how uh, a known fact and an unknown fact relate to one another, uh, the formulation of hypotheses on the unknown fact, as well as the uh, um, allocation of value of probability to several hypotheses. Yet, there's another chapter of this thesis uh, that deals with motivation, which has since been qualified by Tarufo as a logical discourse made up by propositions that are assumed as atomic elements linked to objective elements, free from moral certainties of the judge, rigorously decomposable uh, or that can be broken down in relations between propositions whose core remains essentially the, the judgment of fact that has since been constructed as a judgment of logical probability. And now the last chapter of the, his uh, graduate dissertation tackles a subject that is still uh, subject to a lively debate in the courts today. And I can cite as uh, a judgment of the Italian Court of Cassation uh, just the, some months ago, from October 2021, that deals with a problem to which uh, Michele Tarufo, when he was still a graduate dissertation student, already devoted about 60 pages more than half a century ago. The problem of control in cassation on the maxim of experience. As already mentioned, and as we shall see much better later, many of the uh, research uh, projects that were undertaken uh, since the time he was a university student will be understood, developed, um, deepened, and partly modified in following years. But there is a work in which uh, the basic thesis that was presented by Tarouf in his graduate dissertation is mirrored very clearly, and that was his first publication, uh, titled Il Giudice e lo Storico. Considerazione metodologica. There's an excellent translation of this text into Spanish by Maximiliano Aramburo. Let us see how it works. In 1967, when Tarufo published his first paper, the parallel between the activity of the judge and that of the historian was already common knowledge in literature in the field to the degree that it was substantially a commonplace in Italy. Guido Calogero in 1937 and Piero Calamandre in 1939, two years after that, had already used it. And a similar parallel was also drawn by proceduralist Enrico Redenti. And then in 1926, it was also brought up by the philosopher Benedetto Croce. However, these authors uh, only used it to the degree that the equation between the judge and the historian existed, but they didn't mention anything about the logical activity that could be performed by one or the other. So the juxtaposition suggested as it was was not very enlightening. Therefore, it wasn't very useful, and that's what uh, Tarufo criticized about it. 
in his Utilizando paper, las uh, using the conclusions of his uh, graduate dissertation, Tarufo criticized the model of a nomologic deductive explanation that had been developed by Carl Gustav Hamlet, which was used or based on what we call the uh, general law of coverage. Why? Because Tarufo stated that neither the historian nor the judge have a similar law in most cases. However, Tarufo rejected the idealistic proposals and suggested that inductive models could be used, making the most of his studies on maxims of experience. And the conclusion was that uh, equaling the activity of the historian and that of the judge was well founded, given that they used similar logical uh, tools, unlike uh, the people before him who had argued that analogy was an end in itself, without filling it with content. Tarufo, however, suggested an inductive, a probabilistic uh, model in which both roles can support one another for the factual judgment uh, to occur. In, her, in his first book, Studi sulla rilevanza della prova, Tarufo uh, uh, took back the subject matter and after having conducted a very in-depth comparative research in common law, civil law and socialist countries, he concluded by confirming his thesis that the judgment of relevance of evidence is a hypothetical judgment of logical probability. This is the first book in Italian on uh, how to uh, use evidence and prove facts, which deals with uh, questions of epistemology and analyzes scientific language. He was 27 when the book was uh, published, and he completes and develops the thinking that he initiated in his graduate dissertation. Now, the studies before him were also important and had repercussions on the concept of truth. However, Tarufo did not uh, tackle this up front yet. However, there comes a time in his scientific production where we can see his first explicit approach to the subject. And we find this in the Studi sulla relevanza della prova, where Tarufo, when dealing with the concept of relevance uh, in the procedural systems of socialist countries, examines the principle of uh, material truth. And this, needless to say, is linked to the Marxist-Leninist uh, doctrine context. Now, Tarufo distanced himself from this naive uh, way to understand truth. However, he left a mark. This conception clashed with an extremely different way to understand the truth, which can be found in common law countries. Tarufo had a chance to address this issue in two papers, and then in his third book. In 1979, Il Professor Civile Inversa in the Esperienza Americana. In this book, at least in the first chapter, he speaks about the issue of uh, searching for the truth. And the chapter ends with some notions which, well, doubtful as they are, tend to believe that following in the steps of Damascus, the so-called adversarial uh, trial is uh, structurally inadequate to uh, search for the truth, to determine the truth, even though in American doctrine it is doubtful that that is the end or one of the ends pursued by the process.
Even uh, the most critical Americans of the adversarial procedural model, uh, according to Tarufo, uh, fall uh, prey to this uh, trap, this common sense that is disseminated in specific uh, schools of thought, according to which the judicial uh, consideration of the facts uh, is subjective and uh, away from historical truth. So it is a, a paradox, um, and it's probably one of the least known examples of this school, the realist and George Frank, which uh, at the same time was uh, one of the most convinced critics of the adversary system, precisely because it was inadequate to determine the truth. This, uh, the systematization of the roof of thought and truth is done and achieved with his most mature work, La Prova de Fatti Giuridici, published in Italy in 1992. In this book, Tarufo takes a clear stance on the relation between process and truth, and also puts forth a theory. The enormous intellectual work that uh, supports it gives his thought great strength without hindering its quality. This was one of the fundamental features of Tarufo's thought, extraordinary intellectual soundness, logical solidity, but at the same time, great clarity of presentation. A fundamental premise of Tarufo's theory of truth in the process is that the evidential system is not, nor can it be, a closed system. All in all, the uh, legal dimension is not enough to be able to account for the mechanisms that govern, in particular, the, the uh, assessment of evidence. These are premises on which other authors have been working, providing different perspectives that can reinforce them even further. And I'm thinking about the two wonderful books by Jordi Ferrer on truth in, pro in the process and on the and rational assessment of evidence, but also on other works, such as, for instance, those of Jordi Nieva Fenoy about the assessment of evidence, Joan Pico e Junoy on the right to evidence and, and the um, evidential powers of a judge, or those of Marina Cascon on uh, evidence and reasoning. The theory of the relation between truth and process is crystal clear and is divided into three essential moments. One which is theoretical, another one which is ideological, and the third one uh, of practical nature. The theoretical possibility. Tarufo uh, begins with the observation that some uh, process theories, such as Carnelucci in Italy, have denied uh, the possibility of truth being ascertained in the process, suggesting the very widespread distinction which Tarufo rejects between substantial truth and procedural truth. These theses, in turn, are based not only on philosophical choices of an irrationalist nature, but also on more recent and sophisticated versions of idealism uh, defended by, uh, for instance, uh, Michael Dammett and Richard Rorty. To these uh, notions, Tarufo opposes other conceptions of the relation between truth and uh, legal process uh, developed by a critical uh, idealist able to uh, maintain a certain significant rational connections with the reality of the world. And ultimately, Tarufo defended the theory of truth as a correspondence of the uh, statement with the facts of the world developed by Alfred Tarski against the backdrop of his semantic conception of truth. What can I say about the ideological opportunity of the truth in the process? Well, according to a certain ideological approach, the truth in the process cannot be achieved because it should not be pursued to begin with. And in this case, also in Italian doctrine, this conception of the process was very 
clearly defended by Cardinal Lutti, who conceived the process as a tool for a conflict resolution. And according to this uh, idea, the truth is not useful for the process itself since it can be seen as a possible byproduct of the procedural activity. And immediately after uh, leaving Italian borders, the Rufo finds in Damascus theories a solid confirmation of the conclusion drawn from his studies on the adversary system, identify in the American civil process one of the most uh, uh, illustrious examples of the refusal to consider the search for the truth of the facts as a relevant purpose of the civil trial. And this happens as of the critical formalization of the so-called sports theory of justice, of which Roscoe Pound speaks in the famous uh, presentation of paper delivered in 1906 at the annual conference of the American Bar Association. The famous causes of popular dissatisfaction with the administration with the administration of justice. And according to this one, the purpose of the protest is only to establish a winner. And according to this logic, if we take it to the extreme, the decision would just be a recognition of the outcome of the process understood as a struggle, a struggle. and its correctness should be independent of the content. The decision is correct if the rules of the game have been respected. And the concepts of procedural justice, which appeared at the end of the 90s and early 70s, also conspire in this direction. They go against the finding of the truth. For instance, algunas utilizaciones some ideas of distortion of the truth of the Rawls theory of procedural justice are also Nicholas Luhmann legitimation to in 1969. Tarufo is essentially a guarantor. However, if while you are reading some of his writings, you can, when you are reading that, you can find some exceticism about the process, and this is the reason. Sometimes, he wasn't sure about what was exactly this due process. And he had a clearer idea of the concept of the decision. And he was really worried about this topic. So he decided, he, he, he wrote the last volume of his life, which was entitled Until the Just Decision. Tarufo cree, por otra parte, On the other hand, que de he also believes posible, la de la verdad, that this is theoretically possible and the truth can be sought. Adequada. And this is also Tarufo something ideologically adequate. He refers to the topic precisely Luigi based Ferraioli, on the thesis of a guarantee, which is Luigi Ferraioli. In his Law and Reason, he argues in the context of a contrast between cognitivism and decisionism. Uh, he mentions the fundamental importance of the search of the truth in the process, accepting, moreover, in the context, an ideal model of criminal jurisdiction together with the same definition of truth as it was already created by Karski and shared by Tartufo. Among the Italian proceduralists, Tartufo finds support for the thesis of the ideological opportunity of truth-finding in the process in the propositions of Piero Calamandrei, in particular in the logical genesis of the civil sentence, and amongst his contemporaries, and specifically in those of Sergio Carloni. In the Anglo-Saxon literature, not talking about the procedural one, but the theoretical general one here, Tarufo, Tarufo he finds great thesis, sources that confirm his thesis, according to which the truthfulness of the judgment of the facts is a necessary, though not sufficient, condition for the decision to be said to be just. He obviously mentions Jeremy Bentham in this sense, and amongst his contemporaries he finds support in particular in the studies of Patrick Selim Atia and Robert Summers. Likewise, 
He is also close to Jerzy Wioblewski, who had identified a legal, rational ideology of the decision, which puts him reasonable and also dominant in Western culture. What can I say about the practical possibility of truth in procedure? Again, Tarufo contrasts the thesis of those who maintain that it is practical, practically impossible to ascertain the truth in a trial. This position is based on the grounds that determination of the truth, understood as an absolute truth, as a trial, is not possible for a series of technical reasons. The procedural rules that limit the admissibility of evidence, the res judicata, that makes it impossible to return to the ascertainment of the facts, and the same dispositive principle principle that leaves the parties the prerogative to delimit the facts that have to be found, all this would be sufficient element to exclude the possibility of aspiring to obtain an assertment of the truth at trial. With respect to this position, Tarufo, first of all, he believes that the presence of cognitive limits within the process is not sufficient to justify a differentiated systematic treatment of the truth inside and outside the process. If indeed it is true that the truth of the process is relative because the cognitive tools available are limited, this happens to a greater or lesser degree according to the positive disciplines of the process. But it also happens outside the process, as any cognitive situation in some way is characterized by limits pertaining to the means that can be employed to establish truth. Therefore, there are variations of degrees on a substantially homogeneous scale according to the greater or lesser availability of means of knowledge. But this is not a qualitative and absolute difference which legitimizes the opposition of a procedural truth to substantive truth. In short, treating the assertment of truth in the process and outside the process in the same way constitutes the premise to promote the iure condendo a reform of the law of evidence law, of those systems characterized by limiting the determination of the truth of the facts in the process. So, in other words, if there are serious epistemological obstacles to find the truth in the process in a given positive order, this is not good reason to say that it is practically impossible to discover truth in the process as a whole. It is sufficient, in fact, to adapt the procedural rules to the effect. Finally, Tarufo fights, fights the idea that the evidence would be irrelevant in the civil trial. This thesis was supported by authors who proposed an exclusively rhetorical view of the trial. The authors and works are many, but we could all remember, for instance, the monography by Bennett and Feldman, Reconstructing Reality in the Courtroom, from this point of view, truth, while it may remain a value, this is not interest of interest to the technique of persuasion. We can also think about monography of Bernard Jackson, semiotic and legal theory. Tarufo, he doesn't deny that in the trial and in the process there are speeches. And even when these refer to facts, they are still narratives of facts. He doesn't even deny that the tools of semiotics and language analysis can offer much more sophisticated resources than those normally offered by the jurists' tools. But he does not accept that the semiotic narrative approach transforms the process into a closed system of linguistic narratives with no connection to reality.
Por el contrario, On the contrary, Tarufo, el objeto de la prueba, Tarufo, es precisamente the object of evidence sobre el is precisely a statement about the fact. No queda But como una this does not remain cerrada, as a closed linguistic entity and as an end itself. It constitutes a hypothesis, and on the basis of the evidence can be said or not to correspond to reality. Dijimos antes que Tarufo acepta la propuesta de Tarki. We mentioned before that Tarufo accepts Tarki's proposal of a semantic conception of truth como as a correspondence of linguistic propositions with the facts of empirical world. Una de las mayores ventajas One of the de major la advantages de la of semantic conception of truth consists in the fact that it serves to define the concept de Javier, of truth. El problema de los But it leaves open the problem of methods to determine the truth itself. This advantage, however, becomes a problem when it is necessary to verify the correspondence of the statements with the reality of the facts. Let's see then how to solve this problem of verifying this correspondence. Let's go back to this probability. Probabilistic conception of truth. Tarufo had already had the possibility of exploring this since he had Sin embargo, his thesis. To prove the fact, to show the fact no in probability terms does not mean that the problem is resolved. Unfortunately, los términos probable, terms y such as probable, probability, no or similar terms do not say anything final or certain about the criteria used to evaluate the hypothesis about the hecho. fact. Esto pasa porque no hay And una this sola happens de la because there is not just one theory of probability, but there are many. Al tradicional contraste to entre the traditional contrast between Pascalian or numerical probability and Baconian or logical probability, several others have been added. Among these, one of the most widespread concepts in the field of proof theory is based on Bayes' theorem. Permite and this a esta frecuencia allows probable un valor numérico to entre zero prove y uno. something and a number between y este valor zero and one. And this value dadas represents dadas the conviction degree en el on de a la fact de depending on the del de Bayes, available proof. Tras algunos estudios pioneros After some de pioneering años, studies in the 1970s, this has been widely widespread, this context of the theory of evidence, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world. This is so that this has been reported and explained in various manuals of evidence. Even in the Italian doctrine, in the context of studies of judicial epistemology, there are recent examples of alleged applications of the calculus of probabilities to the logic of evidence. Esto es un ejemplo, el libro de Paolo you can see an example here, the book of Paolo Garbolino, Probabilità e Logica della Prova. The application of Bayesian probability to the judicial no evidence does not convince, as we already know, Tartuffo. And this is so, because the probability calculation must start from a starting point called a priori probability. In the vast majority of cases, this starting point is either unavailable or it is not reliable. Then it became clear that a probability calculation performed on an erroneous or an uncertain starting point can only lead us to unreliable results. Another important reason for his skepticism about this way of calculating probabilities is related to the fact that when there are many circumstances to be proved altogether, this calculation is too complex, or the results are not significant enough, and they are represented by values which are too low. 
al respecto Ronald Allen This is what Roland, el, Ronald sí. Allen says uh, article, in his article A Reconceptualization of, a reconceptualization of Civil Trials which was published in the monography en el libro Rather, que in the book, se intitula Probability and Interference, in Probability of and Interference of, que in the law fue of Evidence, editado por eh, Tiller's Green. It was edited by Tiller's Green. Sustancial de la aplicación the substantial failure a la of the application to the evaluation of proof of probabilistic theories based en el on bias de theorem. No does not, however, induce Tarufo to abandon the use of the concept of probability. On the contrary, he believes that another type of probability should be used, logical or Baconian probability. And here Tarufo mainly uses the studies done by Jonathan Cohen, and probably This is the greatest theorist on the subject, and also one of the hard critics against the use of bias and probability in the context of evidence evaluation. Logical probability is the idea of a probability as a gradation of the possibility of founding inferences concerning a factual hypothesis from the available evidence. Según el lenguaje de Cohen, In Cohen's la gradación de la demostrabilidad de la ventaja de este concepto de probabilidad es que no puede no depende the advantage of this concept of probability is that this does not depend on general frequencies of classes of events, but it depends on having as a starting point the available evidence according to which different inferences are appropriate depending on the types of available evidence referred to. La tesis sobre la relación entre the thesis y prueba on the relationship between truth and evidence in the trial, which Tarufo formalizes in La Prova dei Fatti Giuridici, has the advantage of being a general thesis. Thus, it can be applicable to any type of trial, civil, penal, criminal, administrative, work-related, Any topic, because it is not linked to any legal system. It does not take into account a positive discipline or evidence. The most evident testimony of this approach is given by the final chapter of this work, which is entitled Elements for a Lexicon of Evidence. Here, Tarufo proposes, although starting from numerous references to Italian procedure of doctrine, a substantially universal lexicon. And here, this projects the world work towards the destiny he will find later, especially thanks to the Spanish translation, which was published 10 years later, in 2002. The positions on the relationship between truth and evidence in the trial, which Tarte Dufo formalizes in the proof of legal facts, are designed to be consolidated and enriched, but in substance, They will not change. In the refined publicada, monograph entitled La Semplice Verità, which was published in 2009, the thesis are strengthened thanks to the bibliography that appeared in the meantime, which was read by Tarufo very thoroughly, and these are embellished with numerous literary and historical references. It is worth remembering that in this work, Tarufo highlights the rational nature of some means of proof, such as the ordeal or the duel, which are normally considered a symptom of the irrationalism of medieval evidentiary systems. And on the contrary, he argues the rational nature of the decision models used by the jury. The book, La Semplice Verità, which was translated by Daniela Capino to Spanish and Victor de Paula Ramos to Portuguese, it gives more resonance to Tarufo's thesis, both abroad and in Italy. In 2009, In the International Encyclopedia of Comparative Law, in Chapter 7, evidence was published. 
This was the 16th volume of the civil procedure. And here the work opens significantly with an exposition of Tarufo's thesis on evidence and truth in trial. Then the work focuses on the criteria and rules of selection of evidence, on the possible classifications of evidence, and on the various models of acquisition and evidence of evidence and finally on the decision, focusing in particular on the issue of the assessment of evidence. And in this context, issues related to legal evidence are also tackled, free evaluation, burden of proof and standards of proof. This last topic, the of standards of proof, that of standards of proof is of particular interest. When Tarufo tackles it, he highlights the inconsistency of some standards of proof that are more apparent and real, even especially in common law systems. Here, the concept of a standard of proof seems to have become more entrenched. Tarufo approaches this subject critically and problematically, as always, but he leaves it substantially open to new developments that are, in fact, already available. He started to discuss them with Jordi Ferrer Beltran in order to publish something together. Unfortunately, this work was not accomplished, and Jordi Ferrer, he finished it on his own. And last year, he published the book you can see here, which is entitled Proof without conviction, standards of proof, and due process. No se preocupen. Tiene una, tiene una fin. El legado que nos deja Michael Tarufo no hecho de dogmas. Something alive, not composed by dogma. His way of thinking, mostly his methodological way of thinking, makes us doubt about dogmatic, because dogmatic method insists on the close character of law in general and specifically in procedural law. And Tarufo, he shows us to open our mind, to read more, to broaden our interests, to build an interdisciplinary cultural background, and this is necessary to be able to be intellectuals of our time, but without being trapped in the present. Tarufo, he teaches to study history and to look at the past in order to understand future problems. And and the paths of a law that is open to the outside and avoids self-referentiality. Tarufo, he had a not common ability of transforming any object of study into an extraordinarily interesting topic. He handed it to his, over to his disciples, near and far, so that they could take care of further developments. Those disciples are too many to be named one by one. But many of them are here present in this room now. And I'm sure that Miguel would be really happy. And indeed, I think he is really happy to see them gathered here in his memory. I would like to conclude this speech by remembering something, remembering Michele's relationship with his closest colleagues and friends. I am aware that I have already abused your patience, and I apologize for this, but I feel I cannot avoid saying some more words in order to conclude. 
definir I a cannot Tarufo define Michele Taruffo in, in the relationship with those who, in the last years viaje, of his life, were his fellow travelers, more than pares. using the expression primus inter pares. To Jordi Nieva Fenol, to Jordi Nieva Fenol we owe the merit of having brought together in, in, in the first, first tribute to the Master on the 12th of February 2021, those jurists with whom he loved to surround himself and whom he also considered his friends, as he often repeated, and with whom he shared his study and travel itineraries. And why do I say primus inter pares? Because in open dissonance with the aristocratic and severe traits that was his most immediate aesthetic sign, he reassured his friends making them participants in a mutually enriching dialogue in, in which the constant centrality of his thought was no obstacle to an egalitarian relationship nourished by his great capacity to listen. Entre los numerosos encuentros entre amigos, Among the numerous colegas, meetings between friends and colleagues from different mundo, parts of the world, in, los años, in recent years, en one in particular had become a certainty. La cita de primavera the meeting en el at spring at the International Seminar of Civil Procedure, Procedure Law, Process and Constitution, Constitution which was organized every year by the Pontificia University del Perú de Lima, PUCP in Lima under the masterful scientific direction of Giovanni Priodi Posada. In September next year, we will have the 70th World Congress of the International Association of Procedural Law. In this occasion, as in other occasions, through unusual itineraries, De la that move from philosophy to history, historia, del derecho, from law a la logica, to logic. And they invariably touched also personal and life divina. anecdotes. In all this context, Tarufo became the center of gravity incluyente. of an inclusive dialogue. Así, Thus, si el mundo ha maestro, if the academic world has lost a great master, el those who had the extraordinary amigo, privilege of being his friend have lost an irreplaceable guide and companion of travel and dialogue. De viaje y de diálogo. Michele Tarufo, sin embargo, Michele Tarufo However, belonged to everyone and belonged to no one. Su persona de investigador se ofreció his person y sus obras as a researcher was offered and his works are still being offered to anyone who wants to use them. Los que quedan, Those who remain, los más jóvenes, especially the youngest ones, mirado, to whom Michele was always looking at and trusting them and seeing them with benevolence, they have a not easy task, but which is also very stimulating. They have to collect his immense legacy and to continue with equal rigor his path towards Nuevos new y and horizontes. ambitious horizons. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Luca. I have a couple of uh, things to announce before we can move to a Q&A. I'm sure that there are a lot of questions already. Now, for speakers, uh, when we give them the floor, could you please uh, stand up or raise your hand so that we know where you are before you intervene? Please speak slowly. Remember, there's a simultaneous interpretation into Spanish and English. Therefore, the questions can be uh, asked in any of those two languages. 
First question. For Tarufo, a legal decision is fair if and only if the facts that have been uh, stated and proven are true. If that's the case, is that compatible with his refusal of a moral objectivism? The question is from a participant. I'm just relaying it to you. Okay, thank you. Well, I believe that what he says, what Michele Tarufo claims in his works, without a shadow of a doubt, is that a fair decision does not, it's not necessarily founded on the uh, pursuit of truth about the facts. However, I believe that it is a, a pre-requirement. What happens, though, is that we need to bear in mind as well that this doesn't touch upon the idea of the justice, justice of the law as such, because a decision is fair as long as the law is enforced and it, it applies to uh, the investigation about the facts, about the truth of the facts, which uh, precludes uh, a trial on the justice of the law. So if the law is not fair, we could say, we cannot have a fair legal decision. However, that condition, at least the way I see it, Tarufo defended it all the way to the end. There's no alternative here. If we do not have uh, the necessary tools, that are effective, to find out uh, what the truth is, we have no chance to obtain a, a fair judgment. Okay, great, thank you. Jordi Ferrer has to uh, say something. Thank you, Luca, for your very thorough and outstanding presentation. I'd like to say something along the same lines, uh, picking up on that first question. I think it comes in a very timely uh, moment. Michele Tarufo, unlike many of his uh, collaborators, from an Anglo-Saxon origin, even though they were not from the same place, obviously, was not a moral objectivist. He did not take a objectivist uh, stance about justice or in meta-ethics or moral philosophy or whatever you want to call it. Now, these seem to clash uh, with the idea or the statement that the truth about factual proposition to be added to the facts as part of the legal reasoning is a, a, a pre-requirement of justice itself, because for it to be a pre-requirement about a, a, a fair decision, we need to have a notion about justice and what justice is all about. If we don't have a, an objective notion about justice, how come we can know that the truth is a prerequisite for justice. When he wrote in Italian, he said that the truth is a prerequisite for a fair decision. 
or a just decision. Justa in Italian does not necessarily equal what we call justo in Spanish. It is an ambiguous word, which is used maybe in Spanish too, but not as frequently, to refer to the right decision. Now, you can read that statement from the point of view of the truth is a prerequisite comment for the right decision from the point of view of legal correction, and it changes completely. I believe that the expansion or the proliferation of this moralizing notion of uh, an idea about the relation between the truth and justice is uh, of my own doing, because in the translation of uh, La Prova de Fatti, I translated this idea of uh, decisione giusta uh, by saying decision justa, which then was disseminated, so much so that even Michele himself liked it. We were once walking in Porto Alegre with Daniel Mitideo, uh, driving in his car. Daniel, Michele, and I were in that vehicle. And Michele was uh, working in his latest book, La Decisione Giusta. I had a chance to bring this up to him. And I said, Michele, well, picking this title, La Decisione Giusta, means we're going to deepen into the problem even further. Because obviously, people will continue to, to read this that way. And when the book is translated into Spanish, they will once again call call it uh, the just decision. And as Rodolfo Vigo said, well, he becomes a naturalist uh, in himself. Obviously, he didn't agree with that term. However, he said, but it works fine. It does work fine. So that we can attach more significance to this idea of uh, that we need to search for the truth. But this is a rhetorical use of the term. It is already, it was already a rhetorical use. It's not about sustaining that there's a condition of justice itself. As uh, Luca was saying a minute ago, if the substantive norm we need to apply is one that we consider unfair, I'm not saying that it is objectively, but if I myself deem it to be unfair, if the rule or the norm says that whoever's a Jew should be sent to a gas chamber, and the truth is that the person we have before us is a Jew, obviously determined determining with the truth that that person is a Jew and sending him to a gas chamber is not a fair decision. To my mind, I don't think it is. Unless we're objective, we cannot say if it's objectively just, but we can say whether we think it is. So the truth is a condition for a fair decision. Well, I honestly consider that's not the case but it is one for the right decision from the legal point of view. And that's enough for us. We can leave behind this rhetorical use that uh, Michele liked uh, towards the end of his life. Thank you. Luca? Luca, would you like to add anything or answer back to Jordi? No, thank you. Because I must say that we could not hear you very well with your microphone. And there's an issue with the sound in the room. On to the next question then. What do you think are the main points of the theory of evidence by Tarufo that should be pursued further? Uh, and studied in the future. Well, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, there are many of them. However, I believe that uh, the uh, logical continuation of the set of studies by Michele Tarufo on evidence and this notion that we have uh, just seen I believe that is the main topic, the standards of evidence, the standards of proof 
which I think is uh, the uh, ultimate goal where uh, theory is tackled in, a more, in the most dramatic way and it Porque confronts uh, muy, reality muy because all of this is very well argued from a theoretical or general Pero point of view. But then, when we speak about uh, a decision, a resolution that must be taken on uh, some facts in a dispute or in a specific legal case, it is going to be very difficult to have a, a set of criteria in order to apply the theoretical theses that we were just discussing uh, to reality. Therefore, I believe that uh, among many such topics that could be further studied, the standard of proof might be uh, the field that provides us with uh, more opportunities to develop. And I believe that the book published by Jordi, the two book, the two of them, Jordi and Michele, started thinking together about this. That's a, a starting point. And it opens up a discussion that uh, I think can be very, very fruitful, and it can help us with uh, this uh, topic of this particular rational n concept of evidence in the future development of the field, with an eye to to the practical application and use in specific cases of these general theories. Perfecto, muchas gracias. Lorena Bachmeier. Thank you, Lorena Bachmeier. Muchísimas. Así se oye mejor. Can you hear me better? Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation, which I think has fascinated all of us. Now, I have a very short uh, thing to mention. By studying Michele Tarufo, we're all in awe of him. I've always uh, asked myself whether he was not only ambitious, but an idealist of sorts, meaning he always tried to apply the theories of the scientific methodology to a field in which we know all ready that the method was valuable to begin with uh, all through the process because it's not the right channel to establish or determine scientific truth or to generate scientific knowledge. Uh, that was the conclusion he himself drew. So I'm not sure if there's a certain contradiction which he does illustrate, but at the end of the day it makes us think we're not going to determine any truth and we cannot just shy away from truth either because the shortcomings of the process uh, give us that very result. They will never be close to the uh, theories of a scientific method. I'm not sure. This is just the comment that I would like to share because it's something that I've wondered throughout my life by studying Michele Tarufo. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias por la pregunta. Thank you for your question. It is not a question, rather, it's an observation. And still, I'd like to say something about it. I believe that Michele Tarufo was an idealist. You're right. He uh, denied that we have a difference a reliable difference between the truth, the substantive uh, truth, or substantial truth, and the procedural truth. And he rejected this uh, separation, right? This uh, differentiation. 
¿Por, por qué podemos decir Why can we say no, no estrictamente, estrictamente filosófico que, que fue un idealista? ¿Por qué tenía un objetivo filosófico? Porque tenía un objetivo filosófico que era al máximo nivel to adjust los as much as possible procedural la uh, tools to the determination of truth and i believe that that's the the possible explanation of why this perspective that you just shared meaning We can never compare the scientific determination with that of the legal process. Well, that's a perspective which um, is a bit reactionary, I believe, because what it says, well, let's say it's conservative. Let's just leave it at that, because what, what you're saying is, well, we just need to accept this. And I think that looking at it from this point of view doesn't make it simple or doesn't contribute, to my mind, to the improvement of the ability for procedural rules to determining the truth. That is why I believe that Michele Tarufo had, and that, that's uh, obvious, Uh, the mindset, he was aware that the procedural tools available to us oftentimes are not the right ones. They're not perfect to find out about the truth. Still, he was uh, firm about this. He had a firm belief. He said that it's the responsibility of those that try or investigate the fact to make it possible for the most limiting rules in determining the truth during the process to be changed and to do so so that they become more efficient from that point of view. And I believe that was, that's the way we could say that Tarufo was and is an idealist. Perfect then. Thank you, Luca. What do you think that the knowledge of comparative law contributed no. What do you think that the theory of proof by Tarufo contributed to comparative law? So, you could try to answer both things, uh, either about the contribution of the theory of proof or evidence to compared law, or the other way around, compared law to the standard of proof. Choose to answer. Well, I'll speak about both because I believe that the two areas in all of the scientific production by Michele Tarufo were how could I phrase this? They're linked, they're intertwined, right? They're connected. Maybe that's the word. Por ejemplo, como he dicho en, en mi presentación, Just to give an example, as I mentioned during my presentation, donde, donde where did Tarufo find uh, some ideas about the truth on which he continued to work during his lifetime? Well, in different legal systems. So ever since the very beginning, There's already a connection between the studies about evidence and studies in compared uh, procedural law. Let's just take as an example that the materialistic conception of truth, which is found in the uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, thought, is something that he encountered when uh, he wrote his book. 
Study sulla rilevanza della prova. Studi sulla prova. His first ever book. And then, when he started um, studying the American uh, civil procedure, he uh, was met with an idea about the determination of truth that was completely different. And then he started using the tools of a comparative uh, procedural law in a standard of proof or the theory of evidence and the other way around. What he studied about evidence was then used as well in uh, comparative uh, law studies. So I believe that these are two sides of the same coin, if you wish. We cannot make a distinction between them uh, when analyzing Michele Tarufo's works. And they have enriched one another um, throughout the years. And all of his works, uh, both uh, big and small, uh, show the mark, the result of that uh, gaze, that viewpoint, which is always theoretical, but at the same time uh, quite practical based on comparative law. And I believe that uh, if we are to find a common denominator between the two, the two areas, uh, the two fields of study, is the fact that it's important to have this uh, high venture point that is independent on uh, the positive uh, bodies of law that we find in different legal systems. His is a theoretical, generic view. In all uh, examples, when he studied uh, evidence and when he studied procedural law. And he always had this broad perspective, which also was the case when he was teaching. I used to be in his classroom when I was a student, and um, well, that's something that happened every day. When he uh, explained his notions, even the smallest of uh, notions in procedural law, uh, procedural civil law. He always had this uh, general theore theoretical viewpoint, a comparative viewpoint, and that's not something that he could shy away from. Okay, we have uh, six minutes left. Six, apparently. Uh, well, there's quite a broad question. What, you, what does the speaker think that has evolved in the, the theory of the maxims of experiences ever since the Rufo wrote his dissertation? Let me read it again. What does the speaker think that has evolved in the theory of maxims of experience? OK, I understood the question now. Well, I think that not much has changed, to be honest. I believe that his um, basic theory about the maxims of experience, which is that we cannot use those maxims in the uh, field of uh, syllogism within the framework of a deductive syllogism, which was the way they were used, let's say, when, when applying these maxims of uh, our own experience, is an opinion that I believe he didn't change uh, with the passing of time. There's this um, paper that I read again uh, some weeks ago which focuses on how to use the maxims of experience and presumptions. And we can read in between the lines, obviously, what Michele Tarufo wrote in his graduation uh, thesis. Well, I don't think that theory has changed that much. Well, his opinion, his position uh, has varied that much on that issue. And it's quite striking because uh, in this graduate dissertation, we can find a whole scientific program of everything that Michele became later on. 
nello specifico che non ha cambiato I don't think that the details have changed that much is general opinion about the maxims of experience Okay we still have time for yet another question Now uh, among the most relevant theoretical encounters for Terufo you mentioned Giovanni Terufo Now to what extent the use the real use realist position of the author influenced the Tarufo's thinking. And that's another question that is so easy to answer in just a few minutes, right? Well, I think that um, uh, there is a topic that the use realism has influenced on, and probably Tarufo's work might uh, fall a bit out of the scope of uh, evidential theories is that of uh, precedence. Precedence is uh, another uh, uh, subject matter that Tarufo tackled with, uh, by contributing extraordinarily to the discussion about um, this topic, which again is very important and I feel uh, very close to, at least personally. This uh, youth realism is part of Michele Tarufo's thinking. And as Jordi Ferrer has uh, written, wrote uh, some years ago, Tarufo says that a precedent is something that the judge uh, establishes. So that uh, idea of a precedent is a conception that is uh, um, quintessentially realistic. It means that the uh, precedent is what uh, the judge says it is a precedent. So from that point of view, I believe that uh, una influencia muy fuerte a very strong influence producido en este en este campo has happened and is to be seen in this field. It is probably harder to answer this question uh, from uh, the point of view of uh, evidential studies because we have witnessed uh, different evolutions, different developments of the neo-realistic thinking, or rather use realistic thinking. Why? Because uh, some of the uh, proponents of uh, use uh, realism, we know we know that a, they end up being radical uh, skeptics because while it creates an effect they end up denying that we have the specific uh, possibility to determine the truth during the process. And this happens mostly in American legal uh, realism. So I think it's a burning topic, an amazing one to debate, but a very difficult one. And we don't have much time to elaborate on it, right? No, we don't. Well, very interesting indeed. It's 11. I think the question itself is much more interesting than whatever I may say about it. At least that's what I think. Okay, so we are right now at 11 o'clock. I think that we can give a closure to the initial lecture of the morning. We have a video that is going to that has been prepared about how to raise uh, questions and how to ask for the floor, all the technicalities. You can view it on the app. So if you still don't know how to ask questions, uh, you will be instructed how to do so. You can go to uh, useful information. That's where you will find your video. That's it from us. Uh, thank you, Luca.